contextually accurate, I don't know. But the interesting thing about James is there are not a lot of written pieces of information about James. They're just not there. The Bible didn't include them for some reason. But he is listed among the other disciples. And uh, there's no writings. He, he didn't write any books. There's no major accomplishments that happened. Sort of obscure, right? And uh, really the only major thing we know is that he was numbered among the twelve. He's listed among all of those apostles in all of the lists. So he was there. He heard Jesus' teaching. He saw Jesus' miracles just like all the rest of the disciples, the ones we've already reviewed. He was right there with them throughout all of that. So tonight we're going to look at what it might have been like to be a disciple of Jesus. The things that he heard, how could that have changed him? And then we'll try to understand, you know, what is it about James? Why, why was it so important for him to be numbered among the 12? Why couldn't it have been Pete or Tom or Rodney? You never see disciples or apostles named Rodney. I don't know why. But it could have been any. But you know what it was? It was James. And there were a lot of different James. So hopefully tonight we can jump into this, un unpack it, and get something that we can apply to our lives. Amen? Sound good? Are you guys ready for this? All right, let's start with a word of prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, here we are again. We're in your house. Amen. God, thank you for the people that have uh, decided to come to church on a Sunday afternoon. When the weather was not so bad out, we have so many opportunities to be anywhere but in your presence. But those people who have come here tonight and those people who have tuned in at home have come in to hear your word. So God, I ask you to bless me. Lord, help me to deliver your words. God, use my voice, but have it be your words that come out. I ask this in your most holy son's name. Amen. Okay, let's take a look at James. So we have four different James in the Bible. And I want to review each one of those. The first one we talked about already a couple of weeks ago. We talked about James, the son of Zebedee, right? This is John's brother. You remember the, the sons of thunder? Not like lightning, more like thunder, not too bright, real loud and kind of scary. Yeah, that's James, the son of Zebedee. Then we also have James, the half-brother of Jesus. This is the man who wrote the book of James, right? Then we're going to continue on, and we find out there's another James in the Bible, and this is James, the father of the disciple Jude, or Judas. This is the one, if you, if you read your Bible, it says, and then Judas, not Iscariot, to kind of break him apart from Judas Iscariot because he was a little notorious. You see, this guy, his dad was named James. So we have this James as well. And then finally we get to this guy named James, the son of Alphaeus, who we're going to talk about tonight. And he was also called James the Less. How would you like that to be your name? Yes, this is my son, Rodney the Less. Thanks, Dad. Look, it wasn't about that. We're going to jump into that just in a minute, and I'll tell you exactly what that means. But before we do that, uh, I, I want to explain to you that whether uh, James the son of Alphaeus is James the less or is James the brother of Jesus, there's a lot of debate out there. Scholars differ. They pull out different Bible verses and they say, well, it says this, and someone else pulls this out and says, well, it says that. But here, what we're going to look at is the fact that it's a difficult question to answer, but uh, given the biographical nature of the Gospels. So what we're going to do, and what I'm going to try to do tonight is to, to show you that James the son of Alphaeus is James the less, okay? Which is also James the younger. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, at a Bible verse. I'm going to throw up a couple, and then I'm going to ask you guys to crack your Bibles uh, a little bit later, and we're going to go down through a passage. But for the first little bit, it's going to be on the screen. So let's take a look at John chapter 19, verse 25. Let me set the scene. Here we are at the foot of the cross. 
Jesus is hanging on the cross, and now the gospel writers are telling us who's right there at the foot of the cross. It starts off and says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. Who is Jesus' mother? Yeah, the congregation says Mary, exactly. So we know there's Mary, the mother of Jesus there. Then we continue and it says his mother's sister. Then it says Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So there's a couple of Marys that are there. Then if we take this from John and look at a parallel passage in Matthew, it'll help us to understand a little deeper who was there. So let's take a look at Matthew. When we look at Matthew chapter 27, it says this, of all the people there that were with the Lord Jesus on, while he was on the cross, among them were Mary Magdalene. Yeah, we just talked about that. Mary, the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So now we're understanding a little bit more of who these people are. We're seeing, we're seeing that Mary Magdalene's there, and then there's another woman named Mary who is the, the mother of James and Joseph. Now remember, we saw there was a Mary, the wife of Clopas, right, as well? Okay, one last Bible verse, and then we're going to dive into some, some word uh, entomology here. Mark chapter 15, verse 40. Take a look at this. And it says, there were also women looking on from afar, of whom were Mary Magdalene, yeah, Mary, the mother of James, the who? Less, yes, exactly. And of Joseph and Salome, okay? And so when we see here, the Mary, the mother of James, the less, and Joseph, here's this less. This is where it comes in. And again, like I said, that, you know, you wouldn't want to be called the less, but you have to understand really what it means. When you look at this Greek word, the less, it is actually the Greek word mikros. And it, it's, it's transliterated a couple of different ways in Scripture. Now, what you'll see on the screen right in front of you, you'll see that it's, it's translated as little ones, as less, smaller, short, little. All of these things are references not to um, worth, but often to size or to position, right? So if you would say, this is my little brother, your little brother can be bigger than you. If you don't believe that, ask my brothers. They will tell you, my brother is bigger than me. Yeah, you see, little really is about position or size. So take a look at this. It says that it is... Uh, the, the less importance, some Bible translations call him James the Younger. May, maybe he was just simply uh, a smaller stature or a lesser importance than James Zebedee. So what we're trying to do is, is make a uh, delineation between the Jameses because there's so many of them. If you list them out, all these people, you know, you get confused as to who they are. Anybody that's ever had to help kids do uh, Valentine's Day cards? Who's this Valentine's Day card to? It's, it's, it's out to John. Okay. Who's the next one out to? It's out to John. So how do you know which one to give to, to who? We have to put that last name in. And so that's sort of what's going on here with, uh, with James. We're, we're distinguishing between James, the son of Zebedee, who was a disciple, and then also this other James, who was maybe a little smaller in stature, maybe a little skinny guy, maybe he was just younger. The, the word can mean several different things. You saw that. So the Bible's not specific on why he's the less, just not that he's lesser than, okay? All right. So the other thing that we saw was that he was the son of Alphaeus and Cleophas and Mary, right? So Cleophas was the, it was the area. And uh, we also saw that name, son of Alphaeus, somewhere else. Have you, you guys remember where you've heard that? Son of Alphaeus or Alphaeus. How about when Jesus was walking past a tax booth and he saw a guy sitting in there, Levi, 
Matthew, son of Alphaeus or Alpheus. Yeah, exactly. So um, some scholars take this to mean Matthew and James were actually brothers, which there, there's nothing in Scripture that points to that other than those names, but that's enough for some people. They see that name and they say, oh, they've they're, they got to be brothers. But I'll tell you, that's kind of unlikely because everywhere else in Scripture where there's brothers, they're clearly identified, right? We've got James and John, right? We've got Peter and Andrew, exactly. So we're always lumping these guys in as brothers. But here we go with this James and we, in this Matthew. We never say, and it's Matthew and his little brother, James, it's not there. But another thing that would be very, very strange if they were brothers is their, uh, their family um, dynamic. And what I mean by that is James, uh, the, the last few disciples that we're going to look at, they're sort of leaning towards the more radical of the disciples. The first ones were more they were fishermen, they were more country-oriented, uh, they were focused on those things. We get to uh, Bartholomew that we, we talked about, Nathaniel, right? This is a biblical scholar, almost a rabbinical scholar, who studied in, uh, in the temple, in the church. Then on the other end, you get uh, someone like uh, James the Less, right? James the son of Alphaeus. You get Simon the... Zealot? Yeah, there's more zealous things going on here. These people are a little more um, pushback against Rome. All that to say, if in fact they were brothers, you would not want to go to that Thanksgiving dinner. Because you've got one guy here who absolutely is not happy with Rome. He's leaning towards that wild... Uh, aggressive wing of the political institutions like Simon. And then you've got Matthew, who's actually working for the Romans. So uh, the fact that that's not called out in Scripture as bringing these two parts of a family, blending them and making them whole, I think that would have been significant. I think uh, Scripture would have captured that. So... Um, the lack of information about uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, is actually a lesson in itself. This James was m as much of an apostle as Peter, James, and John. And he will sit on an earthly throne and kingdom, in, in an earthly kingdom. He, he will be on a throne. What do you mean by that? He's going to sit on a throne. Well, let me show you something. In Matthew chapter 19... Verse 28, it says this. So Jesus said unto them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed me, that's you, right? These, these 12 will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You see, even though it's James the less he still has that same place in God's kingdom. Does that make sense? It doesn't really matter what you do or the things that you go through in your life or you know, maybe you're not the most wealthy person and able to do things. Maybe you don't have the biggest family. You know, whatever it is that you compare yourself to, this shows us that it doesn't matter. And God's kingdom... He looks at all of us that way. His name will be engraved on the foundation of the walls of the new Jerusalem. We see this in Revelation chapter 21, verse 14. It says, Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Again, James will not be considered less in eternity because he was faithful to his calling here on earth. 
And that's something that I think some of us need to hear because we struggle. Now, Pastor Rodney, you don't understand. I want to go out and I want to do missional type work, but I can't. You don't understand, Pastor Rodney, there's, there's, I want to be able to, to give so much back to the Lord, but I just can't. Look, don't beat yourself up. God knows your heart. He knows what you're thinking before you even think it. He does not think less of you just because you think less of you. And I think some of us are like that. Some of us don't feel worthy. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to out there that say, once I get my life right, I'm coming back to church. Wrong. Come back to church and let God get your life right, you know, that way. We think we can do things better than Him and we're wrong. James will not be considered less in eternity because he was faithful in his calling on earth. And the thing I want you to remember, if you don't take anything else out those back doors tonight when you leave, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember that the Lord is not as concerned with who you are as he is with whose you are. God's not worried about who you are, but whose you are. Are you His? Are you giving yourself to Him? Instead of just maybe going through the motions. Instead of, you know, reading a, a, a little bit of the daily bread or something. You know, I, I read one Bible, I read a nice little story about, you know, something, and then a Bible verse, and then that's it. If that is your whole Christian walk... When tough times come, it's going to be hard for you. Because, look, there are Bible verses all throughout this, but when you pick up your actual Bible, it's filled. It's filled. It's, it's like going into war, and you get a weapon. I'm going to take my six-shot revolver with me, and I'm going to war. How, how effective are you going to be? Bob, how effective would you have been going in there with just a six-shot revolver? Not real effective, right? That's exactly right. You want a machine gun or you want a bazooka down there. That's a big Bible. That's right. We are in a war, folks. It is spiritual warfare out there, and we need to arm ourselves. And the only way to arm ourselves is to get what's in here, in here. It's not like an attack's going to come upon you, and you're going to have time. Oh, let me just open up my Bible and find a Bible verse for that. That's not going to happen. You're going to have to be prepared. There's a Bible verse that says, be ready in season and out of season, right? Yeah. Be, another way to say it, be ready at all times. You know, you don't, you don't prepare for something when it happens. When your kitchen catches on fire, you don't think, you know what, I do need to change the, the battery in that smoke detector. I should do that right now. Or, I've been meaning to go get a, uh, a fire extinguisher. I'm going to hop over to Walmart quick and grab one. No. You need to prepare before it happens. That's what we need to do as Christians. We need to prepare ourselves. So, maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're, you're feeling a little insignificant, like you're not making a difference. Maybe not making a difference in your life, not making a difference in the lives of those around you. And perhaps you're looking around and you're seeing others around you prosper. Has that ever happened? You're sitting there and as much as you try, it's just not working. But you look over to your left and to your right and other people, without a care in the world, everything's just clicking for them. You know? Some people have it just so easy, it seems. I, here I am trying to pay my car insurance and I got a guy like Pastor Dave who picks up his phone and the guy says, hey, I can save you money on your car insurance. 
I'm just kidding. Have you guys ever had that phone call? They call me all the time. We can lower your rate. I'd like for them to pick up one time. You're going to save me money. I'm going to show you how to save your soul. They're not going to like picking, you know, calling me on my phone. And, and you're wondering why you, can, you seem to be just barely getting by. You seem like you're, you're just barely hanging on sometimes. You know, maybe, maybe it's not you guys. Maybe you guys are in, in the church finally and you're, and you're going, hey, you know what? Actually, I'm doing pretty good right now. I'm sitting in the house of God. I, I'm with, with other people and, and uh, I'm sitting here listening to the word of God. This is pretty good. But maybe it's someone sitting at home that's being buried under a, a mountain of debt. Or maybe it's the family uh, unit that's breaking apart and crumbling right before their eyes. Whatever it is, God knows what problem you have. God knows what you need. But He calls us all to, as Christians to do something. To do something about it. What is our role? What is our goal? What is it that we are supposed to do? Well, to hope, my hope is that this will help you understand what we can do out there. Not just listen to the Word, but apply it to our lives. So I'd like for you to take your Bibles, and I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. And if you've ever been to Sunday school, when you hear Matthew chapter 28, one thing should pop into your head. That's the Great Commission chapter. This is important. And while you're turning there, Matthew 28, we're going to look at verse 16. You at home, there is a uh, Bible right on your screen. There's a tab that you can hit that says Bible. You'll be able to follow along right with us. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. And while you're turning there, I want you to think about something for a minute. Pastor Dave and I have both been at many deathbeds. And it's at that point when you're waiting for that final bit of information from your loved one. Something that they're going to say. Something that has a lot of weight to it. If you knew that you were going to be able to say one last thing, to someone, what would it be? What would you tell them? I mean, it might be just, I love you, which they probably know that, right? You would want to give them some kind of guidance, some kind of life lesson that you learned over your life. Pastor Dave often talks about his dad. And I think, if I remember rightly, it was, take care of your teeth. Is that what it was? Yeah. Some type of information. You see, when people get to the end of their lives like that, the words they speak speak volumes. Those are the ones that you really want to hear. Now, this doesn't work for everyone because some people at that point in their life, they're already too sick and they're not able to, right? But what I mean is if they knew that this was it, here is some important information. That's where we're at right now with this Bible verse. Jesus is just about to go up into heaven. He has spent three and a half years with His disciples, teaching them, preparing them, mentoring them. He went to the cross. He, he rose again. And then He visited with them several times. And now this time... He's leaving for a while, and He is going to leave them with some information, a plan, a blueprint, if you will, on how to move forward when He's gone. This is what James the Less is present at. He's been less all his life, right? And now he's there, and he is listening to Jesus' final words. And so he leans in real close. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, it says this, 
Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus, what's your Bible say? Had? Appointed? Yeah, yeah. So wait a minute. Let me pause, push pause here for a second. It says the, they went away to the mountain that Jesus had appointed. That means that he told them previously to go there, right? So that means this is important. You see, how did he appear to all the disciples? Do you remember? Do you remember when we talked about doubting Thomas? Thomas was there with all of the disciples, and how did Jesus get there? Do you remember? He just appeared, just like that, just like, boop, there he is. It wasn't scheduled. Thomas, we're going to need you to go in here about uh, 2.30 because Jesus is going to come over. No, it wasn't anything like that. They were just together, and all of a sudden, <laughs> Jesus popped up. This one's different, folks. This one's, this one's predestined. This one is pre-scheduled. This one is so important. He said, get out your day timers, folks, because I need you to be here. That's important. I actually have that circled in my Bible. Then the 11 disciples went away to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus had appointed for them. This is the only preset appearance, post-resurrection appearance that Jesus had. It was that important. If nothing else happened in the disciples' life, this thing needed to happen. James needed to be there to hear these words. Verse 17 says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. They worshipped him. It, they took time and they worshiped him you see when when they got to where jesus said to go they worshiped him they could have went anywhere but when when jesus said go here and they did that jesus came to them they had a jesus encounter and when that happened they worshiped him that should be a lesson for us. Jesus tells us through Scripture what we're supposed to do. Be here, go there, so that we can worship Him. Verse 18 says, And then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has the authority to make the demand. Okay? But Jesus also has the authority to deputize. Jesus, He has the authority, and He turns to His disciples and He says, Now I'm going to make you guys bringers of the gospel. I'm the great bringer of the gospel. I brought the gospel from heaven to earth to save man. And now it's your turn to take that gospel out there. You deputize them. I thought really long and hard about what I could do. I was going to have Denny come up and deputize us. I don't know if that's legal, but just to show it, that you guys have that ability. You've been deputized. You have been given the ability to go out there and tell people about Jesus, to bring that good news to them. They're to go and make other people into disciples. And that, that verse also tells us that once they accept Jesus... They should be baptized. There are a lot of people that don't believe in baptism. And look, I'm with you on a few of these things, right? The, uh, the thief on the cross was not baptized before he walked into heaven right beside Jesus. 
But Scripture also tells us that when you make disciples, you baptize them. And that was the outward expression of an inward decision. But look what else must be done. This, it's so easy to gloss over this stuff. It's so easy for us to read through our Bible and go, I've heard that before. Go, therefore, I make this. Yeah, yeah. We'll just slide right over it. Look at verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. It's not enough just to accept Jesus. Oh, there are some pastors... There are some pastors that I would just like to take them and give them just a real good, hard fellowship hug. <laughs> just saying, I accept Jesus, is not the end of the story. It is the beginning of the journey, folks. But, but churches out there, they're only concerned with numbers. How many decisions for Christ did you get today? How many people came to Jesus today? I don't care if it's three trajillion. What I want to see is disciples. I want to see this Bible verse lived out in all of our lives. Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. You must accept Jesus, but then learn. Learn what to do with it. You know, it makes all the difference in the world. Let me say this a different way, and I think it'll make more sense. If I were to go next door and get one of the children from the children's ministry, I mean, let, let, let me go get Adam Audi because he's not accident prone. For those of you that don't know, he's got a broken arm. If I go get him, and I might, you know, I'm... If I'd have thought this through, Mike, I would have done this. I'm going to bring him over, and I'm going to give him a chainsaw. Okay? Because that's what that Bible verse says. You just give them Jesus. You just accept Jesus, and that's it. You don't have to show them how to use it. I can just give them the chainsaw. I don't have to instruct them. Go have fun, son. Right? No, that's not what that Bible verse says. It says... You get Jesus, but then you have to learn what to do with them. You have to learn how to walk with him and grow with him to allow him to change your life. Because I don't know if, you, if you're getting what I'm, I'm throwing down here, but if I give him that chainsaw, none of these trees are probably going to get cut down. I mean, maybe a leg or two. But w the work that needs done is not going to get done. Amen? Amen. I've got to show him how to use it for the work to get done. You see, it's not enough to just get Jesus and that's it. You've got to learn what to do with Jesus for the work to get done. And there's so much work to get done, it'll, it'll make your hair curl. And I know most of you probably did have curly hair over the quarantine. It just got so long. But... Scripture tells us that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few, aren't there? There's not enough. There's, there's enough work to go around, but there's not enough workers. But you don't have to do it alone. How do you know that? This is why I love the Bible. This is why I love it. Look at the next verse. You know, you're, you're sitting here going, ah, that just seems like a lot of work. I mean, I'm going to have to learn this and then go out and do what God wants me to do, and I'm, and I'm already overworked. I'm a little tired, and there's so much stuff. And look at verse, the, the last part of verse 20. What's it say? And lo, I know you know this, I am what? With you always, even to the end of the age. Folks, you don't have to do it alone. He didn't have to put that in there. He could have said, go therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace out. I'm gone. <whistles> Up in a cloud. He could have done that. But he didn't. He said, it's important that you know, now that you have that, you have to learn and grow. 
in your Christianity, in your walk with Jesus. But you don't have to walk alone. I will never leave you. I will be with you forever, that verse says. So, who did Jesus say that to? Did he say it to the one? No, he said it to the eleven. He said it to all of them. He said it to, to James, who may have been struggling with being less than everybody else, or specifically less than the other James. But God says, you're worth it, James. You are so worth it. And he's saying the same thing to you tonight. You're worth it. You might not realize you're worth it, but I've got a plan for you. And if you could just learn to use that chainsaw, oh man, we are going to cut down some trees. We're going to build some homes. We're going to build some churches. And we're going to change this world. But what do we do? We let the pastors be the one to do it. Okay, pastor, go tell them. You go tell them about Jesus. And we'll put a little notch on the wall. That's not it at all. We are just responsible to carry this out. Just like James the son of Alphaeus. Or James uh, the less or the younger. You see, we often think that these people in Scripture, these, these amazing people, these these superhuman folks that could just do these amazing things. Newsflash. Jesus didn't need people like that. He needed people that were devoted to Him, that would follow Him, that believed in Him, and He would help them learn and grow and be with them, and they changed the world. And if you don't believe me, for these past few weeks, we've been studying men just by their names. What amazing thing did they do? They put their trust in Jesus. You see, <clears throat> the twelve were average, ordinary men who did extraordinary things for God. God can take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. And it has nothing to do with the thing you're using. Listen. Over quarantine, I made a lot of pies, okay? I did. I baked some pies. I was having a good time. But no one took a bite of my pie and went, mmm, that's better than Rosie's. Nobody said that. Why? Because I use flour. Rosie, do you use flour? I use sugar. Rosie, do you use sugar? So wait a minute, if I use the same ingredients, I'm using the same exact thing, why was yours better than mine? Yeah, exactly. Someone, someone yelled, she's a better cook. You see, it's not the ingredients, it's what the master does with the ingredients, right? A paint-by-number set in my hand is different than if you put it in Bob Ross's hand. God is what makes things extraordinary. Allow Him to use you. Your life, you're never going to get a big head with me here. You're not that special. Okay? You're ordinary folks. But it's God that will make you extraordinary. If you just give Him the chance. Just give Him the opportunity to use you. God can take that which is just natural and make it supernatural. This is what he did. So here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> you can close your Bibles up. We're going to sing a closing hymn, and then I'm going to close us in prayer. So if I can have our musicians come up. So what are you going to take with you out those doors? Or when you shut off your computer screen or your phone, what are you going to take with you outside? How about the fact that you were created for a purpose? There is a reason God wanted you on earth, and it wasn't to pay taxes. It wasn't to go work. It wasn't to do, you know, whatever it is that you do day to day. <clears throat> 
He made you for the purpose for this commission that we just read. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptize them. And then do what? Teach them. Learn them up. Have them walk closer with Jesus. Don't just give them Christianity. Here you go. Good luck, kid. I hope you do better than I did. No. Walk alongside them. So as we, uh, as we sing this closing hymn, I want you to think about that. There should be a story about your life. You know that end, end of life thing that I talked about? That's a story. That's the end of that part of the story here on earth. You should love to tell that story. There's a story in each one of us, and there's a story about Jesus. Will you sing this? Let's sing this together. Here we go. I love to tell the story. And I pray that each one of you will have the ability to tell that story. Each in your individual way on what you did for Jesus. You're going to leave here tonight and you're going to go out that door. And either this lesson and this message about James, who was less, will change your life or it won't. Will you pray with me? God, as your people walk outside this door, set them on fire. Give them a burning in their heart for you. Let this be the last day that we take our salvation for granted, that we take our calling for granted, and that, Lord, we lean on you and we tell that story. We tell what you have done in our lives and we tell others about what you did 
for everyone. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Hey, we will see you next week at Smith Corner Church where your faith and your life intersect. God bless.